I'm Tom and uh, this is Q&A number two. So you might have been wondering why I didn't upload a video last Sunday and that is because I had to reinstall my whole desktop computer Windows stuff and that always sets me back by quite a bit because there's just so much software and settings and stuff to, to install and do. So yeah, I'll, I'll be back on track this Sunday and uh, until then, here's this week's Q&A. So I've been getting a lot of questions, so thanks everybody for sending those in. Uh, there will be a whole bunch of Printabot simple metal related ones on this one uh, towards the end. There's a marker here if you want to skip to that. And uh, the first one, non Printabot simple metal related, is uh, from Ivan Ho. I hope I pronounced that right. Asked via Google Plus Has anyone compared the differences of using Direct Extruder versus Gear Extruder? Comparing the differences, are there a trade-off between printing speed and resolution, etc. Thank you. Um, as far as printing speed goes, there isn't much of, an, of a difference there. The main part that's going to limit your speed is the profile of your hopped, bolt, hopped gear, drive gear, whatever you want to call it. Um, as soon as that loses grip on the filament, you're screwed. Uh, but basically the torque from your motor isn't going to limit you that much uh, unless you are printing 3mm with a direct extruder. That is not a good idea, so people don't usually do it, so yeah, torque is not a problem. And the other part to that is resolution, and resolution is kind of an issue on both 3mm geared extruders and 1.75mm direct extruders. Depending on your exact setup, uh, especially depending on how well your stepper drivers are set up. If you set them to a fairly high current instead of turning smoothly and extruding, they will look something like this, like clock, 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 skipping to the half step positions instead of micro stepping smoothly in between. And for example, on the Printabot Simple Metal, I think I saw that exact issue, I saw that exact pattern that it makes on the first layer. Um, but usually it's not going to be much of a problem on any normal layer height. Like if you're printing 0.15 or 0.2 millimeter layers, it's not going to make a difference if you're using direct drive or a geared extruder, as long as your stepper driver for the extruder is somewhat correctly tuned. Next question by Jack B. Balter. Timing builds. Which build do you recommend? Um, depends, as always. Uh, on my printer I'm using 15mm wide HDD 3M, so a 3mm pitch HDD belt, which is probably overkill, but I don't care. Um, the first printer I built, which was a Cells Mental, used T5 belts, 5mm wide, and uh, there wasn't much of an issue with that either. So whichever belt you can realistically get and uh, get in somewhat decent quality. Uh, these days that is GT2 2M, so a 2mm GT2 profile, 6mm wide, that is the standard belt and that usually works really really well. Unless you are running a very very heavy printer, like say a super heavy heated bed, or a direct drive extruder that has like four stepper motors on there and is just trying to move around. That isn't going to work well. Um, yeah, but if, you know, decent GT2 belt, that's, that's what I'd recommend. That's what I'd say you should go for. Um, the question goes on to asking about um, metal or glass fiber cord belts. And the T5 belt on cells or the Prusa Mendel were always kind of fine. They had a metal cord in there. And you know, that cord is so thin that it doesn't really get any fatigue from constantly bending back and forth. Uh, belts are made for that kind of load. The GT2 belts typically have a glass fiber cord in there and that also works pretty well. Of course the metal cord is going to be stiffer, but it's not going to make much of a difference. Jack then furthermore goes on asking about why his belts are failing and slipping off the pulleys and stuff. Um, that is not an issue between metal cord and glass fiber cord belts, or it's also not a problem about GT2 or any other belt profile. It's a problem of assembling your printer correctly. So I'd recommend going through the assembly steps again and checking that he actually did everything correctly and uh, didn't miss a washer in some place. So next question from Alan Sanderson. Hi Tom, love that you are doing Q&As now. Thank you. Here's my question. What are the differences between different slices? For example, slice er versus cura. 
Are there times I would want to choose one over another? Quick answer to that. Use whatever slicer you are comfortable with. Use whatever one you have tuned in for your printer and that will give you the best results. Um, I'm personally using Slicer because it has so many options and I like options. But if I'd have to recommend a Slicer, I'd say go for Cura. Um, there are other people swearing by, for example, Kiss Slicer. And, you know, if that's what you want to use, it will give you good prints as well. Just, you know, you have to spend a bit of time tuning it in. That's where Cura is awesome at. You don't need to spend so much time adjusting every single parameter because there aren't as many settings to adjust and Cura figures out most things for you. Now, one other slicer that I've been getting heaps of questions about is Simplify 3D. And Simplify, for, for those of you that, that don't know, Simplify 3D is a $140 paid closed source slicer. And from a lot of people that are using Simplify 3D, you are hearing that it has a great support material. It gives super nice, super detailed prints without any artifacts whatsoever. Um, thing is, that's also what I'm getting with Slicer and it's also what I've been seeing with Cura. Here's, here's my take on Simplify 3D. I, in, in fact, I tried contacting them. I had a couple emails back and forth and asked for a trial version just for me, just a like time limited two week thing. I don't want to you know, get it for free. I just want to try it out. And they were like, hmm, who are you? I don't know you. You're not getting any free software. So yeah, I haven't tried out Simplify 3D because I am very happy with Cura and Slicer and you know, all the other open, open source softwares. They work well for me. I don't see the need of spending another $140 on a piece of software that is basically the same thing as the open source pieces of software that we have. Um, and the other thing that I see is if you are willing to spend $140 on a slicer, I'd rather recommend taking $70 of that, giving it to Alessandro Ranocelli who developed Slicer, and taking the other $70 and giving it to Dade Bram, who develops uh, Cura for Ultimaker. Or if you want to do it the other way around and take $140 and spend it on your favorite slicer, say for example Cura, Dade Bram or Alessandro Ranocelli will be happy to program whichever functionality you want for you personally if you make that kind of donation. So to get back to the original question, which slicer do you recommend? I'd recommend Cura. Are there differences? Yes, there are, but any slicer can print very, very well. Uh, slicer is a bit more complex, Cura is a bit simpler. Kiss Slicer is, I don't know, Windows 95 style. I didn't like it that much, but it's a valid option as well. Use whatever slicer you are comfortable with. Uh, use the slicer that you have set up for your printer and you will get nice looking prints and uh, you will be able to make it do whatever you want it to do. And a whole bunch of questions came from Vivid Eska about the print about Simple Metal. So here's how it starts out. Hey, another nice video. Thank you. I got my Prusa i3 sold recently and considering getting a print about Simple Metal instead. I have a question for you. Why are you selling a Prusa i3? That is not a bad printer. Why would you want to downgrade to a Simple Metal? I, I, I do not understand. Uh, anyways, uh, before I'm buying it, is it worth getting the simple metal heated bed? Does it actually never reach 90 degrees Celsius? The genuine print about simple metal bed seems a bit over-engineered and too expensive for the things I like. It does actually not reach 90 degrees Celsius. Yes, because uh, it is a very low power bed. Either way, if you're using the genuine print about simple metal print about heated bed, or a third party one, you will still need to replace your power supply with an ATX or like one of the industrial caged ones. Um, and that is also going to add to the cost. And I just don't think that it's worth it for the print about simple metal. Uh, you can get a Ali rubber, Ali brother rubber silicone heated bed that you simply stick on the bottom of your bed and connect that to the electronics. That works well also. Um, and those are like 15 euros for the entire area. And as long as you don't take that above about 100 degrees Celsius, that is going to work just fine. So yeah, if you want a heated bed, that's the way I'd recommend doing it. Now, is it worth having a heated bed at all? Um, thing is, you can print nylon, PLA and some other filaments without a heated bed. Um, but a heated bed is going to help you in either way. So. You know, if you want to print ABS or also if you want to print nylon or flexibles or, you know, those those new materials, uh, a heated bed 
will help you or, or will make it possible to print those. If you are going to stick with PLA, which is what I'd recommend, um, you can use blue tape, blue painters tape, if you get the right brand, that will work pretty much perfectly. The Ultimaker one did it, the PrintBot Simplement still does it, and if you're only printing PLA, that is going to work just fine. You will need to replace the blue tape every now and then, but who cares, that stuff is cheap. Next part of that question is, uh, will E3D hot end V6 fits on this printer? Thing is, the V6 is shorter than the V5, and it is actually too short for the print about simple metal. Uh, if you install a V6, which fits in the original aluminum extruder body just fine, you can install it in there, but the nozzle will not be reaching the surface of the print bed anymore. So the way you can go about that is by either looking for the longer V5, if you can find that somewhere, but not producing them anymore, um, or by making a 3D printed adapter that mounts the hot end below the extruder body and not in the extruder body. And that should give you those extra 10 millimeters that the hot end needs to reach the bed surface. But generally, yes, the V6 is totally compatible with the printabout simple metal. Uh, you just need to find a way to get the nozzle low enough. Next part of the question. Is the UBIS hot and good enough for high temperature operations, say to print nylon, or for flexible materials, say NinjaFlex? Uh, that's two parts. One is high temperature. Uh, the UBIS is a classic hot end that uses PEK and Teflon and uh, silicone insulation and stuff. Um, and those should not go above 245, 250, some, somewhere in that ballpark uh, degrees Celsius because the Teflon will start to give off toxic fumes, the peak will melt and the silicone will degrade, uh, all not things that you want to happen. So yeah, 245, 240 degrees to be safe should be the maximum to use the UBIS hot and add. Um, nylon can be printed at 240, 245 will work just fine. Um, ABS also works in those temperature ranges. You might need to slow it down a bit to get good layer adhesion, but it will work. Again, without a heated bed, ABS is not a good idea. A uh, heated bed also helps for nylon. So if you have a heated bed, nylon and ABS are an option. If not, you should probably stick to PLA, which I'd recommend for the print about simple metal anyways. Next part of the question, uh, flexible materials. The flexible material printing performance will depend much less on the exact hot end used, um, but more on the filament path that takes the filament from the drive gear to the heated zone of the hot end. And the E3D V6 fixes that nicely by using a Teflon tube all the way from the last bit of the hot end that is still cool to the wherever you want it. Basically you can run that all the way to the drive gear, which is what I'm doing on my printer and which is working pretty nicely. And it's also what you should be doing for flexible filament as that will give you the best results. If you don't have that sleeve in your extruder filament path, you will need to slow down your printing speeds quite a bit. It's not impossible to print flexible filament with the stock print about simple metal, but it will be easier if you make a couple modifications there. Next part, is there any way to modify the firmware like using Repetero, Molin or Arduino IDE? Uh, the print bots all use the Molin firmware and that thing is open source. You can download the source code and the configurations for the print about simple metal and modify to your heart's content. I made two videos on that, one, two. Um, yeah, you, yes, you can. You will be using Arduino IDE to modify it or any other text editor to modify the config files directly. Next part, will Raspberry Pi be able to detect the serial port for Octopi? Um, I have been reading about a couple of people that have issues connecting to the printer bot through Octopi, but it should work in theory. It should work. Next part, is it possible to run serial cable from the board, direct RXTX cable from printer board to Raspberry Pi? Um, yes, it should be able if you use a level shifter. The Raspberry Pi is a 3.3 volt system, while the Arduino on the printer bot simple or the printer board is a 5 volt system. Um, you can't directly hook those up as it will fry the Raspberry Pi. It's not a thing that you want to happen. So either use a level shifter and hook that up or simply plug it into USB. That is the recommended and simpler way to do it anyways. So I hope that answers your questions, Vividesca. Um, if any of you have more questions that you want me to answer, send them to me on Google+, Plus. leave a comment on YouTube, any way you can contact me. And as always, thanks for watching.